This is the 10th video in a series devoted to complex analysis. And in this video, we want to look at the basic notion of a conformal mapping, as well as Mobius transformations. So there's a lot more that can be said about conformal mappings, but we'll need a little bit more technology or more kind of standard results. And since this is still the beginning, we can't go so far, but we can do some basic stuff. Okay, so for the first definition first. So let's suppose that we have a subset of the complex numbers and then a function from that subset into V. And that function is both one to one and on to. So we say that F is conformal at Z naught in D if it preserves angles between directed intersecting curves at Z naught. Then we say that it's conformal on all of D. I guess these should be D's here. If it's conformal at every Z in D. Then we'll hold off this definition for later after we've talked about conformal maps for a little bit. So we really have the following question to start off with, and what does it mean to have the angle between two curves? Well, in short, we can define the angle between two curves at an intersecting point as the angle between the two tangent vectors. So I've written that out here. So let's suppose that we've got gamma one and gamma two are functions from an interval of real numbers, I've called it i, into the complex numbers, and they intersect at z naught. Furthermore, we'll reparametrize these so that they intersect at the same value of the parameter, just kind of for ease of use. So we have gamma 1 evaluated at t naught is equal to z naught, which is gamma 2 evaluated at t naught. Then next, we'll define the angle between gamma 1 and gamma 2 at z naught to be the angle between their tangents at z naught. So that'll be gamma j prime evaluated at t naught, which is xj prime t naught plus i yj prime t naught. Assuming that we've got this real and imaginary decomposition of our curve x1 and x2, or gamma 1 and gamma 2. So now before we write down like a formula for the angle between these two curves, let's recall the following thing from linear algebra or maybe multivariable calculus. And that is if we have u and v, which are vectors in Rn, then the cosine of the angle between u and v, so I'll maybe denote that as cosine of theta sub uv to me they mean the angle between u and v, is given to be u dot v over the norm of u times the norm of v. So that's nice. So now let's put that into the language of these intersecting curves where we assign these complex numbers, which are the value of our derivatives, to vectors in R2. So let's say if we've got gamma j prime at t naught is those two over there, well, maybe let's simplify it. So let's say that gamma one prime evaluated at t naught is equal to x one prime plus i y one prime. So we'll just leave off the evaluation, but it's understood to be there. And we'll do the same thing for gamma two. So we have gamma two prime at t naught is equal to x two prime plus i y two prime. So here we're thinking about this in terms of R2 as follows. So we have our vector u is like the vector x1 prime, y1 prime, and our vector v is like the vector x2 prime, y2 prime. Okay, but we really like to write this in terms of complex operations instead of like the dot product and stuff. So let's see how we can do that. Well, putting this all together, we see that the cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between these two, will be given by x1 prime times x2 prime plus y1 prime times y2 prime. So that's like playing the role of u dot v. And then in the denominator, we have the norm of u times the norm of v, but notice that's exactly the modulus of these. So I'll write that instead of as norm, as modulus. So we have the modulus of gamma 1 evaluated at t naught times the modulus of gamma 2 evaluated at t naught. 
But like I said, we'd like to write this whole thing in terms of complex operations. We've done that with the denominator because uh, taking a modulus is kind of an obvious complex operation. We can do that with the numerator as well if we use the real part operation. So this is in fact going to be the real part of gamma 1 prime evaluated at 2 naught times gamma 2 prime evaluated at 2 t naught conjugate. So just you can calculate this if you take the gamma 1 prime times gamma 2 prime conjugate, then take the real part, you get exactly this numerator. So we have this over the modulus of gamma 1 prime evaluated at t naught and gamma 2 prime evaluated at t naught. Okay, and I think that's kind of a nice closed form for the angle between two complex numbers, if you will. So now let's get rid of this, and then we'll see an example of this happening in action, and then prove a general result. So for this first basic example, we're gonna look at two curves, find the angle between these two curves at an intersection point, and then map these two curves under the function f of z equals z squared, and recalculate the angle, thus checking that this function is conformal at the appropriate point. Okay, so what two curves do we have? We have gamma 1 of t, which is t plus i t, and then we have gamma 2 of t, which is t plus i t squared. We might as well just take t to be real numbers. Now, these intersect in two places, but we'll just look at one of the intersection points. Okay, so let's draw pictures of these curves. So notice this one right here, gamma one, the real part and the imaginary part are the same. So that means that lies along the line y equals x. So there, we've got this right here. This is our curve gamma one. Okay, nice. Now let's look at gamma two. So here, our imaginary part is our real part squared. So this is the parabola y equals x squared. So we've got this like parabola like this. Okay, nice. So this is gamma 2. So like I said, that intersects two places, right here at the origin and right here, which is at the point 1 plus i. Remember, we're in the complex plane here, so we want to think about this as the point 1 plus i. Now, where do we want to go from here? Well, let's find the angle between these two curves. So I won't draw the tangent lines in here because it'll get kind of messy. But in fact, what we're finding is this angle here. We won't actually find that angle. We'll find the cosine of that angle. Okay, but in order to do that, we need to find the derivatives of these evaluated where we get the point 1 plus i, which is at the point t equals 1. Well, let's maybe point that out. This is the same thing as gamma 1 evaluated at 1 and gamma 2 evaluated at 1. So now if we have gamma 1 prime evaluated at 1, that will be equal to 1 plus i. Then gamma 2 prime evaluated at 1, that will be 1 plus 2 times i. So that's pretty easy to calculate just by taking the derivative and plugging in t equals 1. Now we can easily calculate the cosine of the angle between these. So notice the cosine will be equal to, let's see, 1 plus 2 in the numerator because we have the dot product. You can think about that as the real part of gamma 1 prime times the conjugate of gamma 2 prime. But in practice, if you've got a concrete example, it's easy just to do it with the dot product, if you will. You'll see, we'll use that other formula a bit later. Okay, so cosine of theta here, so that's the numerator. And now we have the norm of this, which is the square root of two. And then we have the modulus of this, which is the square root of five. So in the end, we get three over the square root of 10. That's the cosine of the angle between these. So what we wanna do from here is map these using the function z is sent to z squared. So let's see what happens to these curves first. So let's recall z squared will double the argument while it squares the distance from the origin. So since the argument here on this green line is fixed at pi over 4, that means doubling it will make it be fixed at pi over 2. So we get something like this. And we actually only get the ray in the first part. That's by some stuff that we saw quite a bit earlier in the class. And then what happens to this parabola? Well, it's actually a bit interesting you get these two kind of bubbles so I'll just draw this one like this but we also get one that's happening down here okay 
So now we want to calculate the cosine of this angle, which is our new angle between our intersecting points. Let's notice that this point right here is the point two, because that's the new intersection point after like composing these curves into the square function. Okay, so now let's define some things. Let's say that gamma three of t is equal to f evaluated at gamma one of t. So let's see, that's gonna be this thing squared. That's not too hard to calculate. That's gonna give us something like two times i times t. Notice if we multiply that with itself, the real part disappears because we get t squared minus t squared. Okay, now next we'd like to calculate gamma four of t, which is gonna be f evaluated at gamma two. So just to reiterate, this gamma three is the image of gamma one and gamma four is the image of gamma two. So that means we need to square this. That's also not so tricky. Let's see, we'll get t squared plus t to the fourth. I should say t squared minus t to the fourth. So that's our real part. And then it'll be plus two times i times t cubed. So something like that. But now we can take these derivatives and then again, evaluate them at one. You might say, well, why at one? Because that's still the parameter for the intersecting point. So if we take gamma three prime evaluated at one, let's notice we get two times i. And then if we take gamma four prime evaluated at one, what do we get? So here, we're going to get two minus four, that is negative two. And here we'll get plus six times i. Now let's calculate the new angle, the angle between these two. So I'll write that as cosine theta prime. So theta prime will be the angle between these. So it's gonna be the dot product of these two. So, let, so that's gonna give us two times six in the numerator. So that'll give us 12. And then in the denominator, we will have the square root of four, which is two times the square root of two squared plus six squared. That's the square root of 40. Okay, but now we can cancel this out a little bit. Notice this 12 cancels down to a six by canceling that one. And then furthermore, we can take, let's see, a two out of that radical that divides the thing inside the radical by four and then cancel that with this six and that leaves us with three over the square root of 10. So let's notice the cosine of the angle between these two curves is the same, which means the angle is the same because we're just taking the angle to be between zero and two pi where cosine is one to one. And so that means at least at this point right here with these curves, this function seems to be conformal. Okay, so let's clean this up and we'll do a general result. Now we're ready for a nice general result. And that says that if f is analytic at z naught and f prime of z naught is not equal to zero, then f is conformal at z naught. Let's recall that being analytic at z naught meant that we were complex differentiable at z naught. Okay, so let's maybe see how this goes. So we need to start by taking two intersecting curves that intersect at Z naught. So let's suppose that we have gamma one and gamma two that go from an interval I to C with gamma one evaluated at T naught is equal to Z naught, and that's equal to gamma one or gamma two evaluated at T naught. So maybe we've reparametrized one very, very simply so they intersect at the same point of our parameter, although that's not super important. And then let's say theta is the angle between these two curves at Z naught. So between gamma one, gamma two at Z naught. And then let's also say that theta prime is the angle between the composition curves F composed with gamma one and F composed with gamma two at f of z naught. So now we're in a pretty good spot here. What we'd like to do now is calculate the cosine of each of these and show that they're the same. But we'll in fact just start with the cosine of theta prime and work that until it's the cosine of theta. Okay, so let's do that. 
So we have the cosine of theta prime is equal to the real part of f composed with gamma 1 prime evaluated at t naught times f composed with gamma 2 prime evaluated at t naught conjugate over the modulus of each of those. So we've got the modulus of f composed with gamma 1 prime evaluated at t naught times the modulus of f composed with gamma 2 prime evaluated at t naught. So we've got something like that. So instead of using the dot product like we did for our basic example, we're using this method that involves the real part, which is a nice complex number operation. Okay, so now what we'd like to do is use the chain rule. So I'll recall the chain rule over here. But that says that F composed with, I'll say, gamma J prime evaluated at T naught is equal to F prime evaluated at gamma J T naught times gamma J prime evaluated at T naught. Okay, so like I said, that's just the chain rule. Very, very similar to something you would see in a single variable calculus class. Let's also recall that this gamma J evaluated at T naught is Z naught by our assumption. So that means we can rewrite this quite a bit. So we have this is the real part of, so this guy up here will now be F prime Z naught, gamma prime T naught, and then we have times F prime Z naught, gamma two prime T naught, and then a conjugate over this whole thing. And that was gamma one prime there. So that's occurring in the numerator. And then in the denominator, so I'll do it like this, we have the modulus of each of these. But now I can use the fact that the modulus is multiplicative to rewrite this as F prime Z naught modulus squared times gamma one prime evaluated at T naught in the modulus and then gamma two prime evaluated at T naught also in the modulus. Okay, so that's just applying that chain rule to the numerator and the denominator. So next up, I'll take this guy right here, this F prime, this guy right here, which is F prime conjugate, and multiply them to give me F prime evaluated at Z naught modulus squared. But that's gonna be a real number. It's in fact a positive real number. We know it's non-zero because of our assumption over there. That means we can bring it out of the real part operation and we're left with F prime Z naught modulus squared and then the real part of what's left over. So that's gamma one evaluated at T naught, gamma two prime evaluated at T naught conjugate over this stuff that we had over here. So we've got F prime Z naught, and then that's modulus squared, gamma one prime T naught modulus, and gamma two prime T naught modulus. But now we can do a bit of simplification. Notice this guy cancels this guy and we're left with exactly cosine theta by that formula that we developed earlier. So just to reiterate what we have, we started with cosine theta prime, we ended up with cosine theta, but that means our angle theta is equal to our angle theta prime, which is exactly what we wanted. So before we move on to our next topic for the video, I'd like to look at a little question, which is where are certain standard functions conformal? Let's recall they need to be analytic one-to-one -one and onto. So that means we're gonna have to restrict domains to make them one-to-one. -one. Then once we've made them one-to-one -one by restricting the domains, we look at the range to make them onto. So let's look at our first function, which takes z to z squared. And by drawing what happens here, we'll also see the region at which z going to the principal square root of z is also conformal. Okay. So here's what we need to do. We need to restrict this complex plane over here so that this thing is one to one, but we can do that by just looking at the right half of the plane. So we will not include the imaginary axis. So let's put a dotted line here. Then, then we include this right part of the plane. And then that's gonna map to everything over here except the negative imaginary axis. So we get something like this. 
So that means that the map z to z squared is conformal for any set that's totally contained in this right half of the plane. And then the image is over here in this slit complex plane. And likewise, over here in this slit complex plane, if we have any open set, this principal square root of z will be conformal and its image will be over here. So now let's see what we have for the exponential function and the principal logarithm. So let's recall that the exponential function is 2 pi i periodic. So that means we need to look at a strip. So we'll take the strip to be like this. So it'll be from i pi to minus i pi. And then in this region, e to the z is 1 to 1. And what does it map to over there? Well, it in fact maps to everything except for this negative real axis again. So here, we'll put it like this. You can see that it does not map to the real axis because e to the i pi would be negative one and that's on the real axis, but that is not included here, nor is like the similar copy of it included down here. So there we've got a picture for the exponential function and the principal branch of the logarithm. Those are the regions on which these functions are conformal. Okay, so let's get rid of this and then we'll start talking about Mobius transformations. Now we're ready to look at our second little topic for the video, and that is the notion of a Mobius transformation. So let's look at the definition. So first of all, we need something called the extended complex plane. And so that's denoted by C upper star. And let's just recall, although I think we've talked about this a bit earlier, that C upper star is equal to the complex plane union the point at infinity. You can think about the point at infinity being anywhere infinitely in any direction of the complex plane. It also can be thought of as like the number one over zero in essence. You can think of the point at infinity being infinitely in any direction in the complex plane. So we view a Mobius transformation as a function from C star to C star that's of the form f of z is az plus b over cz plus d, where ad minus bc is not equal to zero. And then we'll take f evaluated at infinity to be a over c. That's what you would get if you were to take the limit. And then f of minus c over d is equal to infinity. Notice that would give you a zero in the denominator. So that's how we look at the arithmetic of this c star, if you will. Okay. So I'd also like to point out that Mobius transformations are necessarily invertible if we have this condition AD minus BC is not equal to zero, but I'll leave that as a warm-up problem. You can calculate the inverse pretty easily. So now for our first big result. So let's say we have two sets of distinct points in C star. So we have Z1, Z0, Z1, and Z2, and then W0, W1, and W2. So maybe W0 is equal to one of the Zs, but none of the Ws are equal to each other and none of the Zs are equal to each other. So what we'll prove is that there is a unique Mobius transformation, F, such that F evaluated at Z0 is W0, f evaluated at z1 is w1, and f evaluated at z2 is w2. So we'll start by constructing a Mobius transformation that has this property, and then we'll prove that it's unique. So let's start, start by defining the following two Mobius transformations. So I'll say the first one is called g of z, and it's z minus z0 over z minus z2 times a complex number, and that complex number will be z1 minus z2 over z1 minus z0, like that. So def definitely that's a Mobius transformation. If we think about this guy right here is just a complex number and multiply it through to both of those, then it definitely has this form over here. Okay, so I'd also like to note that if we evaluate this at z0, we get zero. So let's note we have g evaluated at z0 is zero. And then what's g evaluated at z1? Well, you can see if we plug z1 into this, everything cancels down and we get the number one. And then g evaluated at z2 will be infinity. So we haven't constructed something that goes from the z's to the w's, but we've constructed something that goes from the z's to the points zero, one, and infinity. Now we'll construct another one that goes from the w's to 0, 1, and infinity, and we'll do that similarly. So let's define h of z 
to be z minus w naught over z minus w2 and then times uh, w1 minus w2 over w1 minus w naught. And now by this construction, we have the same sort of identities that we do over there. So let's notice H evaluated at W naught is zero. H evaluated at W1 is one, and H evaluated at W2 is infinity. Okay, so now how can we define F? So let's define F to be the composition of one of these with the inverse of the other. So let's see what makes it work here. We wanna input Zs and output Ws. So that means we need H inverse composed with G. I think that'll make it work. Now let's just check on Z naught. Then after we've checked Z naught, we'll see that this is going to hold for all of the rest of them very, very similarly. So F evaluated at Z naught is equal to H inverse of G of Z naught, but that's equal to H inverse of zero given that G evaluated at Z naught is zero, but that's equal to W naught because H of W naught is zero, so H inverse of zero is W naught. Like I said, we know there's an inverse by a warm-up problem that is upcoming. Now you can do the same kind of thing for Z1 and Z2, and you'll see that you get W1 and W2. So in fact, we've constructed a Mobius transformation that does exactly what we want. Now we want to show that it's unique. So we constructed a Mobius transformation that takes z naught to w naught, z one to w one, and z two to w two. Now we want to show, uh, and now we want to show that that Mobius transformation is indeed unique. And we'll do that by showing that the identity is unique in essence. So let's suppose that we have a Mobius transformation K and that k is defined by a z plus b over c z plus d and it satisfies the following rule k evaluated at z naught is equal to z naught k evaluated at z1 is equal to z1 and then k evaluated at z2 is equal to z2 but let's see what that really tells us so if k evaluated at z naught is equal to z naught that means that a z naught plus b over c z naught plus d is equal to z naught but now we can turn that into a quadratic equation that quadratic equation in z naught looks like this so we have of C Z naught squared plus D Z naught um, equals A Z naught plus B. But now we can also notice that similarly, we have equations for Z1 and Z2 because they satisfy this same rule right here. So we have C Z1 squared plus D Z1 equals A Z1 plus B and c z2 squared plus d z2 equals a z2 plus b. So in other words, we have three solutions to the following polynomial equation, c z squared plus d z equals a z plus b. But that's three solutions to a quadratic polynomial equation, because notice this is a quadratic polynomial equation. But all quadratic equations have at most two solutions and this, unless this is identically equal to zero. So that means this must actually be identically equal to zero because we have more than the possible number of solutions. But that means that A equals D equals one and B equals C equals zero. Notice that gives us something that is identically true all the time here. Okay, but let's notice if A equals D equals one and B equals C equals zero, that means K of Z is in fact equal just to Z, the identity function. So that tells us that the only Mobius transformation that fixes three points is in fact the identity function. Okay, so now let's use this to prove our uniqueness property. Now we're ready to finish this proof off. So let's suppose that we have F1 and F2 that are both Mobius transformations such that F1 of ZJ equals WJ and F2 of ZJ equals WJ. This is gonna be true for all J from the set zero, one, and two. 
So in other words, we've got two Mobius transformations that satisfy our rule here. But now let's notice that F1 composed with F2 inverse of Zj equals Zj for all j from this set 0, 1, 2. Just by putting a function with the inverse of the other function, kind of with a similar trick to what we did before. Okay, but that means this function, f1 composed with f2 inverse, fixes three points. It is a Mobius transformation that fixes three points, but that means it must be the identity function. But if these two compose to the identity function, then we must have f2 inverse is the same thing as f1 inverse. In other words, f1 of z is equal to f2 of z as needed. Okay, so let's get rid of this and then we'll talk a little bit about the geometry of these Mobius transformations. So we're going to finish this video for the really important property of Mobius transformations. And that is in the extended complex plane, Mobius transformations map circles to circles. Now, before we jump into this proof, we'd really like to open our mind to what we mean by circles in the extended complex plane. So here, there are really two main types of circles in the extended complex plane. There are normal circles, which do not contain the point at infinity. So you would think of those as just like, like I said, normal circles. They're everything that is an equal distance from a certain point, which we would call the center. And then there are circles that contain the point at infinity. So, like I said, the point at infinity in the extended complex plane is infinitely in any direction. So if we have a straight line like this, then eventually it approaches the point at infinity in that direction and in that direction. So that has this property of linking that up into a circle, if you will. Okay, so that means we need to show that Mobius transformations map circles to circles where we have circles in this loosened idea. Okay, so let's break this into two cases. So case number one is that our original circle does not contain the point at infinity. But if our original circle does not contain the point at infinity, then we can write it as z minus, let's call it alpha, modulus is equal to r. So where alpha is the center and r is the radius. So we could write that in here. So here our center is about right there. So that would be our point alpha. And then that distance would be our r. But notice that's going to be the same thing as, let's see, z minus alpha modulus squared equals r squared. Now I'm going to make a little bit of an argument, which is not a big leap, and that is that we only need to look at inversion. So let's only look at um, that our Mobius transformation given by z gets sent to 1 over z. And that's because every Mobius transformation can be written as a composition of a dilation, which is just multiplication by a number, a translation, which is just addition by a number, and this inversion. Dilation keeps a circle as a circle, and then translation obviously keeps a circle as a circle. So all we have to check is that inversion also does this. So now let's keep that in mind, and we'll set z equal to 1 over w, and see what this circle looks like in the w plane. So notice that means that we have the modulus of 1 over w minus alpha squared is equal to r squared. We can multiply through by the modulus of w squared, and that's going to give us something like this. We'll have modulus of 1 minus alpha times w squared equals r squared modulus of w squared. So something that looks like that. And now I'm going to leave a little bit of algebra for you guys. So let's say we set w equal to u plus i v and plug that into this equation right here. So through some simplification, you can end up at the following equation. And that looks like this. We'll have the modulus of alpha squared minus r squared times u squared plus v squared plus a number a times u plus a number b times v plus the number one equals zero. 
So now if R is equal to the modulus of alpha, then, then this cancels out and we have the equation of a line. But let's recall that lines were considered to be circles containing infinity. So that's actually not too bad. But if this guy right here is non-zero, then we can do some stuff with completing the square and we clearly get the equation of a circle out of this as well. So either way we look at it, we get the equation of a circle in the W complex plane, which is like the UV real plane. Okay, so let's get rid of this and we'll look at the second case. Okay, now we're ready to look at our second case, which is when the original circle does contain the point at infinity. So that means it's of the form ax plus by equals c in the xy plane. But we can rewrite that using our complex number as, let's see, if we're thinking about z as x plus i, y, this is a times the real part of z plus b times the imaginary part of z equals the number c. Now let's do the same sort of substitution. We'll set uh, z equal to 1 over w. So we're moving from the z plane to the w plane under this inversion. And that is going to give us a times the real part of 1 by w and then plus b times the imaginary part of 1 divided by w equals c. Okay, so I think we're in a pretty good spot here. Now what I'd like to do is set w equal to u plus i v, like we did before. But notice that means that 1 over w can be written as u minus i v over u squared plus v squared, just using a standard rule for inverting a complex number. But now we can extract real and imaginary parts pretty easily. So the real part of 1 over w will be u over u squared plus v squared. So here we have a and times u over u squared plus v squared. Then we can do the same thing for the imaginary part. We'll pick up a minus sign. That'll be minus b times v over u squared plus v squared equals c. Now we can multiply through by u squared plus v squared, and that gives us au minus bv equals c times u squared plus v squared. Now if c is non-zero, well then that's just the standard equation for a circle. So again, we mapped a circle to a circle. But if c is zero, then we get au equals bv, which is the equation of a line in the uv plane, which again is thought to be a circle in this extended complex plane. So either way we look at it, a Mobius transformation will map a circle to a circle. Okay, so let's get rid of this and I'll leave you with some warm-up problems. So I'll leave you with three nice warm-up problems, one which has several parts. So the first is to show directly that the function f of z equals z cubed maintains the angle of intersection of these two curves. So in other words, you'll find the angle of intersection of these two curves and then the angle of intersection of the image of these two curves. So we've got gamma 1 is t plus t squared i and gamma 2 is t squared plus t i. Those intersect a couple of places, but let's take the point to be 1 plus i. So next, let's find the Mobius transformation that takes 1 to i i, 2 to 1 plus i, and 3 to infinity. And finally, I'd like to show these like kind of standard results about Mobius transformations, which aren't that difficult, but just require a little bit of writing down. First is that if you compose two Mobius transformations, you get a Mobius transformation. Second are that all Mobius transformations are invertible, and you can explicitly write down an inverse. And then third is that every Mobius transformation is a composition of a dilation, so in other words, a map that takes z to alpha z, a translation, in other words, a map that takes z to z plus beta, and the inversion, z goes to 1 over z. And I think you'll need more than one of a couple of these to string out a arbitrary Mobius transformation as a composition of these, so just keep that in mind. Notice that all of these properties right here were really important to some of the proofs that we did. So it's really important to understand that these are true and to write down the proofs. Like I said, they're not that difficult. Okay, that's a good place to stop.